Hi, my name is Colleen Sarnas. I'm the lead dietitian at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. And today I'm going to talk to you about intradialytic parenteral nutrition. Throughout this recording, I am going to refer to this as IDPN. So what is IDPN? IDPN is the provision of nutrients, usually amino acids, dextrose, and lipids through the venous chamber during hemodialysis. So like most other things in healthcare, you must document the need for IDPN before it's covered. So IDPN is covered under Medicare Part D. And the documentation for necessity for IDPN is very similar to the documentation that people utilize to document malnutrition in adults in the acute care setting. So any weight loss of 5% in one month, 10% in six months, or 20% in one year can help meet the criteria, along with decreased albumin of 3.5 or less over a three-month period. And also, you need to have a medical necessity documentation of ongoing counseling with the patient at hemodialysis, encouraging them to take high protein supplements and consume adequate protein and overall caloric intake. So if you can document um, lack of this or, or the presence of a low albumin and um, weight loss, it's likely that you will get IDPN covered in the outpatient dialysis setting. Um, one of the things I did want to add about hemodialysis as compared to an acute care situation is the increased use of documenting albumin in that setting. I think over the years, it's been frowned upon to utilize albumin as a tool to address nutritional status. And in the dialysis setting, it's really not focused in a nutrition perspective, but it's more focused on um, increased risk of mortality, which is a big deal in this population. If there's a way that you can provide some type of nutrition in this setting and help prevent mortality, that's definitely the overall goal in these patients. So does the literature support IDPN use? There are a few studies that show improved anthropology metrics and improved albumin and prealbumin in this setting. But unfortunately, the largest study done on this population, the sample size was 186 patients were followed for a year that were on IDPN. And the study ended up showing that the it, IDPN did not improve mortality or decrease hospitalizations. Um, I think sometimes in nutrition research, we get a little bit too hyper-focused on just mortality and decreasing length of stay. And just the fact that you're improving the patient's anthropometrics and nutritional lab values needs to really be considered as a possible improvement in quality of life. But um, unfortunately, I don't think we're there yet as far as looking at that in terms of evidence to supportive use. So the components of IDPN are very similar to normal TPN with the exception of lack of inclusive electrolytes. Sometimes vitamins and minerals can be added into this solution as well, but typically the solution is either dextrose and amino acids or lipids can be included in the solution. The complications associated with IDPN are similar to TPN. Um, you can have a refeeding response if you're not eating well, um, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. Um, some of the characteristics of a reaction to TPN in a hemodialysis patient that might differ from an acute care patient is the risk of hypotension, um, nausea, and vomiting. But you're always going to have the risk of hypotension when you're at hemodialysis anyway. So I don't know necessarily if those risk factors are true association and IDPN specific. 
for simplicity purposes, it's a lot easier to use a pre-mixed solution for IDPM patients versus having a compounded center, especially if you're in an outpatient dialysis setting, you most likely don't have the resources to do your own TPN compounding. You know, the benefits for ready to use IDPN are an increased storage life of the solution. Um, there's some ability to individualize the solutions in this setting, obviously not as much as you would get if you're compounding a product. And they're usually electrolyte free, so you don't have to worry about any kind of abnormal lab values. If you look at the attached picture, you can see a patient that's receiving IDPN at an outpatient dialysis center. And the bag is clear because there's no vitamins or minerals added. And also there is no lipids in the solution. So this would be an example of a standard solution that they would use a hemodialysis. So one of the questions for someone that is new to the whole IDPN experience is exactly how the IDPN is infused in the patient during hemodialysis. So we all know that during dialysis, blood is taken out of the body and waste is filtered and the blood is returned to the body. So if you look at the picture, you can see that there is an IV pump of IDPN hanging next to the dialysis machine. So the pump is just filtered through the bag, through the line and goes back into the venous port of the patient along with the filtered blood. You don't want to run IDPN and filter it out and then return the blood before you have a chance to filter all the waste products out. You would get it three times a week. You can only give so much, you know, you're, you know, there's only 25% amino acid solutions over a certain time frame. So as much as I would love to give a dial uh, IDPN patient more calories, we have limitations and the amount of time that we have to administer the product. So the max amount you can really give is about 150 grams of dextrose, 100 grams of protein. So the benefits of IDPN are to provide a high concentration of nutrients as much as you can in a relatively short time frame. So as a result of that, you might be initially at risk for a refeeding response. So I'm going to give you an example uh, of 100 grams of amino acids, 125 grams of dextrose, utilizing a 20% amino acid solution and D50. So that solution is going to make 500 mLs of amino acids and 250 mLs of dextrose. So that's a total of 750 mLs that you can infuse over a three-hour time frame. So that's a max infusion of 250 mLs an hour. So you take the 125 grams of total dextrose divided by the patient weight, which in this example is 50 kilograms. And you're going to get a glucose infusion rate for a 50 kilogram person of 13.8 milligrams per kilogram per minute. So typically when we're starting someone at, with dextrose at risk for refeeding, we would start at a much, much, much lower rate. But if you're using the same product for a 100 kilogram person, the glucose infusion rate is going to be much lower at 6.9 milligrams per kilogram per minute. So you really have to factor in the patient's weight and how much weight they've lost and how they're really eating before you set up IDPN in that patient. So one might also think, oh, well, they're on dialysis, their phosphorus levels are already high, so it doesn't really matter if they refeed a little bit, their levels are still going to be high. And that's definitely true for some aspects, but it's still something you need to pay attention to and you need to draw their labs and monitor for trends and monitor for um, post-administration -administ changes. 
So I want to go over a case study of a patient that would meet the criteria for IDPN. A 68-year-old male with a history of type 1 diabetes with a failed kidney transplant and a non-healing diabetic foot ulcer has been on your dialysis unit for the past five years. He's been frequently hospitalized over the past few months due to wound infections, and he has been losing weight. He's currently five feet nine inches, and his estimated dry weight is 148 pounds. Six months ago, his estimated dry weight was 170 pounds, which is a 13% weight loss. His BMI has decreased from 25.3 to 21.9. His albumin has also decreased from 3.6 milligrams per deciliter to 2.9 milligrams per deciliter. He reports an aversion to protein-rich foods, specifically meats. The patient also refused all of the oral nutrition supplements that were offered to them because they claimed it caused them GI distress. His most recent hemoglobin A1C is 8.2%, and his postprandial blood sugars have been 210 milligrams per deciliter. His pre-IDPN labs show a BUN of 13 which is reflective of a lack of protein intake. And his phosphorus level is 2.6 pre-dialysis. And he is currently not taking any phosphate binders. The dialysis dietitian worked with the dialysis team to obtain approval for IDPN. Some things to consider with this patient is, is he a refreeding risk? While he is currently eating, he's mostly consuming carbohydrate-rich foods, and I'm questioning whether or not he is compliant with his insulin regimen because his blood sugars are on the elevated side. I'm also concerned that his phosphorus levels are going to drop once we administer some type of insulin to control his blood sugars. So while this patient isn't a receding risk, I would start on the lower end of dextrose, about 50 to 75 grams in the first infusion, along with 75 grams of amino acids. And definitely monitor his labs post-dialysis and supplement with either oral phosphate, or if the facility allows, add phosphate to the PN solution. In the era of diagnosing malnutrition more and more frequently, IDPN is an underutilized tool that can possibly show some really positive benefits in improving the nutritional status of patients. I also want to encourage people who work in this population to monitor performance improvement criteria, either being lab values or weight gain or even wound healing in this population because Research is definitely needed to show its benefits. And perhaps if more and more research occurs, it might be something that can be utilized more in the acute care setting as well to help with this difficult population. Mm -hmm.